somatoform types of disorders is just simply focusing on health issues. And look at what they do. They read health magazines. They count how many pills they take. They got to remember doctor's appointments. Um, they doctor shop. Uh, this is standard in all the literature about what somatoform patients do. Why? They're obsessing. Only the content is instead of parking meters, they're obsessing about health issues. And they're beginning to get into imagination as part of that obsession. Um, well. The dissociative disorders, let's see if there's one in between. Okay, how are the dissociative disorders? How do these fit into the pattern? Well, we've all heard of dissociative amnesia and dissociative fugue. This is where uh, whatever stimulus or stress at the top of the uh, pyramid, w if it's so strong, it can initiate actually intensely forgetting about the situation, but it only lasts for a temporary period of time. Um, they call it denial. I really don't like that word, denial. It's the most overused word in the world. The individual is basically blanking out and blocking out obsessions or blocking out thoughts only temporarily as a chance to recover from whatever the stress was, but eventually the pain is going to come through. Amnesias and fugues don't last but maybe a couple of days and then the pain breaks through. I do not believe in permanent amnesias or permanent fugues except when they are caused by trauma or brain disease like a tumor, etc. But the interesting one is the multiple personality. This has been so mystified, and we don't know how to treat it. We don't know, is this a neurotic disorder? Is this a psychotic disorder? Is this insanity? We don't even know how to handle it in the courts. And I have met so many uh, criminals that have tried to convince the mental health professionals that they had multiple personalities, the dissociative disorders. What is going on here? Do people have multiple personality disorders? Do they have that? Well, I think kind of they do, but what's really going on? I don't know if you all realize this, but the popularity of uh, multiple personalities began uh, probably with the book and the movie The Three Faces of Eve, which was really about Chris Sizemore, who lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, which was right down the road, and she made a living for an entire life uh, talking about her multiple personalities and um, going on the speaking circuit and supporting herself. Just before she died, she wrote her autobiography where she admitted that she faked the whole thing. Um, if you look at the dissociative disorders, the way that I see them is the patient is engaging in intense fantasy about being a personality, being someone differently. It's like an intense game of pretend. You remember when we were children, we played cowboys and Indians and we played doctor. Um, you remember those days? And you would get so caught up in your fantasy that you wouldn't hear for a while your mother calling, you know, Billy, you know, come on in for lunch. You know, your dinner is ready, come on in. And then you would come out of it, but you would be intensely focused on your game well, I see that as what's happening with dissociative identity disorders or multiple personalities. They intensely get into that role. It is an obsession. They focus on it, and they focus on it to avoid responsibility for behavior that they see as threatening. We know that almost every single multiple personality has had a painful childhood, and that there usually was severe abuse which I believe can be associated with certain behaviors, such as in the movie Sybil or in the book Sybil, um, if she uh, engaged in a certain behavior, she had to pretend like music. She was tortured at the piano. So playing music, which was a sacred part of her, required that she intensely pretend that she was someone else, a different personality, so that she would then be able to play the piano. And that would then absolve her responsibility and it would absolve her of the pain in her life and reliving that pain by focusing on being whatever personality that was. When she did art, she had been tortured in a box um, where she would, would, as part of her childhood ritual, she'd grab some crayons so she could draw on the inside of the box. 
uh, and then drawing or artwork, interestingly enough, she became a professor of art history, would be another game that she would do with intense pretending and focus. Do I think they, need, uh, they don't need help? No, they do need help. But I see this not as a mis mystery of some kind of disease or something mysterious. It's an intense game of pretend that is highly inappropriate way of coping with stress. It's obsessional. It's obsession that relieves them from the pain of their lives. What about the sexual paraphilias, the uh, sexual deviations? Again, if you look at these individuals, they spend inordinate amounts of time focusing on engaging in these patterns of behavior. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. It takes a lot to buy just the right raincoat. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. You gotta watch my dry humor. Um, and we know that fantasy is a large part of their rituals. Why is this any different than an obsessive compulsive ritual? This is just as obsessive and just as compulsive. Why? Well, theoretically, these individuals are escaping from the stresses and pains in their personal lives. Now we move into the sacred cow, schizophrenia. What possibly could be motivating or reinforcing about somebody being schizophrenic? Well, an interesting thing is we, all of us, we see and hear things all the time. We do it day and out day in and day out. We basically see images in our heads. Do we not? Can you not picture a beach scene where there's water and something you know, going on and actually almost as if you're living there? Do we not think thoughts and sometimes so intensely it sounds like we're hearing somebody talking to us? I remember, um, well, that would be kind of personal, but I remember uh, my ex-wife had moved a, a thousand miles away with my children, and I had, uh, was in a lot of pain, and um, she came back uh, within four years, and I have, my sons are here with me uh, now on this trip. Um, but uh, I remember uh, just uh, thinking all the time about the pain, and then when I could get my thoughts elsewhere, I could alleviate the pain for short periods of time. And I had this thought one day, which sounded like a voice talking to me, don't tell her that you're looking for a job down there. I could attribute that to some mysticism, I could attribute it to God talking to me, I could attribute it to voices in my head. It was my own thought. It was a thought. So we have thoughts and images all the time. All that differs with uh, us in our so-called normal lives and the schizophrenic is intensity. The schizophrenic intensely engages in their inner world of thought, their inner world of images, and these become increasingly vivid. Um, hallucinations and delusions, delusions in the form of voice hearings, as Mary Boyle beautifully expressed in last year's conference, these are our own thoughts and images, except with the intensity being stronger. And we know that most schizophrenics that we have ever had have had either early life stresses that were tremendous or are undergoing tremendous life stresses in the present where they fall apart. And where do you turn when you have nowhere to run? Inside yourself. Into the world of obsessions to shut out the painful reality of the outside world and your life. Um, these are nothing more than strong sensations of thoughts and images. Uh, okay. Whoops. The idea is the more severe the outside stresses are, the more we turn to our inner world. Now, Peter Bregan, uh, I think, beautifully used.